today, obesity and childhood obesity. We're talking about a national issue with a local perspective and local experts. I'm Bobby DeMuro, and this is A Healthier Charlotte. The Center for Disease Control has identified that the number one cause of preventable death in the United States is obesity. And we have a chronic disease problem not only nationally but locally. North Carolina is the 14th most obese state in the country, and South Carolina is the 8th most based on statistics from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in July. The problem is local, the problem is regional, and the problem is national. And today, we're going to explore the problem and solutions. Let me introduce my guests. First, to my far right, I'm joined by Dr. Shivani Mehta from, Carol from excuse me, the Teen Health Connection, I should say, here in Charlotte. To my immediate right, Molly Barker from Girls on the Run International, which we'll talk about in a second, is a very interesting organization. To my left, Dr. Pam Young from Matthews Children's Clinic. She's a pediatrician. And to my far left, Jennifer DeCurtins. She's a personal trainer, group fitness instructor, and yoga teacher. So I guess to start, I'll, I'll ask the toughest question first. Um, we know that obesity is an issue, and we know the numbers. I can, I can talk numbers all day. 70 million people in America are obese. Almost two-thirds of America is overweight or obese. First question, Dr. Mehta, how do we define obesity? What are we looking at when we talk about obesity? So obesity in kids is different than obesity in, in adults, but we look at BMI, so their proportion of weight to their height. And BMI is body mass index. Correct. And when you're looking at children, you're looking at a percentage because as they grow, they get taller and the amount of weight that they can carry on their bodies changes. And so obesity is defined as a kid that's BMI is above 95th percentile for their, for their weight and height. And a, an overweight child will be somebody that's between 85th and 95th percentile. And, and BMI isn't necessarily always the best measure. Is it, there's some shortcomings to BMI, Dr. Young? There can be. Um, People who have a very high muscle mass, lean muscle mass, will potentially have a higher BMI, but not necessarily be obese. And it, but, but at the same time, when we talk about population health, it's, it's almost the best number that we have to define an issue. Yes, I would say <laughs> yes. I, so uh, I can say how much of a problem is obesity in our society? We know it's a problem, but culturally, sociologically, Molly, where do we start when we look at obesity and childhood obesity and the toll it's taken on some of the kids locally and nationally? Well, I know that the girls that I work with, um, many of them come into Girls on the Run thinking and in a mindset that I can never do this. You know, they've already established this belief in themselves that I'm not capable of moving my body because they're already overweight. So somehow, you know, we've got to help these young kids start at a very, very young age and first of all, believing in themselves and that their bodies are truly capable, but also including it in their lifestyle, you know, incorporating it from the time they're very little, this celebration of their bodies and all the cool things it can do. In, in the talking about the lifestyle, Jen, you work with a lot of people who voluntarily are interested in getting fit or staying fit. W what does the lifestyle component mean, and how, if, how do people effectively incorporate exercise and healthy living into a lifestyle that maybe didn't know is included? It really just takes commitment to making a change in your life, making activity not just something that you do every day, but a part of your every single day routine, a part of the way you live, the, a part of you know, the, the way you eat. Everything just becomes this whole holistic lifestyle rather than just focusing, I'm gonna eat really healthy this week. It has to, or I'm gonna go to the gym every day this week. It has to become part of uh, just every day this is the way I live my life. And to talk about sustainability, specifically with children and with teens, Dr. Mehta, when you look at teenagers, are they, I guess, interested in making that sustainable lifestyle, or is it kind of a struggle with a lot of them? Well, I think when you're a teenager, you're, you're struggling with a lot of things. You're not just struggling about you know, your weight or your body image, but you're struggling at school. You're struggling with your relationships with other people. And so you know, for some, it can be a priority, but it's not for everybody. And, and to talk about, I guess, a, a experiential uh, experience, experiential background here with Girls on the Run. How have you seen some of these young women develop that lifestyle and kind of develop into those habits? Well, the truth is, and I've been at this personally uh, and loving exercise and that lifestyle since I was very young. I think once, first of all, we got to make it fun for kids. Mm -hmm. And second of all, I think once they experience it, I mean, I see this with the adults that get, get going, get moving, it feels really good. Yeah. I would and say too that to to have a family role model, the kids can't cannot do it on their own. Right, right. 
And, and that's a big issue and something that I was curious. We were talking off camera before the shoot about telling kids, not necessarily telling kids, but, but having a conversation about being obese, being overweight. How do you balance the conversation and the need to discuss we need to get a little healthier mm -hmm. with concern about their body image and some of the psychology behind it? Right. And, and as we talked earlier, um, just focusing on the health issues, the potential disease associations, and not making it all about a number. And Right. Oh, go ahead. Right. No, no, just not making it about a number or about how you look. It's really, we want you to be healthy. We want you to feel good. We don't want you to have to take shots for diabetes, that kind of thing. And let's talk about the diseases because I could go through a laundry list of things that are caused by and linked to obesity and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But instead of scaring a kid or a child or, or even an adult, really, how do we encourage them to understand that there are diseases caused by this, but with a little preventative care, we won't see them necessarily? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that sometimes it's important to make a list of things, especially if you know in the family history that there's diabetes or heart mm -hmm. disease. If you mention those things, you can you can get them to start picturing their grandfather or their aunt who has to give themselves shots um, every single day in order to be well. And so mentioning that briefly is okay, but also talking about just feeling good, being able to concentrate in school better, doing well in school, being more energetic, and, and focusing on the good things that matter to them right now is good motivating source for, for kids. And, and, and that's a good thing, I guess, focusing on the good and focusing on what feels good. When you work, Jen, with people on a fitness level or on a yoga level, when they start to kind of realize that this is something I can do and this is something that's sustainable for me, what are some of the ways that we can encourage behaviors that, that promote this feeling good that's also a positive way to live? I think it's so hard for some people because they start out at something and you have to be a beginner. You know, you can't come in day one and be yeah. just awesome right out of the gate. You have to go to your first yoga class and be the person that's struggling, but you have to be okay with that. And you always need to let feeling good build you up and never tear you down. So I think once they start seeing improvement day to day, whether it's in the yoga studio, in the gym, but those tiny milestones that they're meeting day to day, I think that's what like really keeps people moving, driven, and committed to following a healthier lifestyle. And that's a great point. There's more psychology behind this than maybe we realize. Talking about the psychology of that, how does an organization like Girls on the Run use role models, not necessarily just for fitness, but self-esteem, role model behavior, whatever. How do the coaches kind of function in with the kids? Well, it's, it's about being authentic, and it's about, like, just being yourself. And that's the great thing about kids is they keep the adults honest. Um, I will say one thing that we really stress in the very first lesson with the girls is, you know, you're, you are the owner of your body. Mm -hmm. No one can take that away from you. So it is your option whether you skip, hop, jump, roll, cartwheel, or run – we just want you to move it and realize that, you know, you are responsible for that. And I think a lot of times little kids have never thought about that, you know, that like, wow, this is mine. I can do this, you know. So yeah. I think there is a mindset that, you know, you're responsible for that. And, and, and at what age, I guess, maybe this is a, a question for the doctors, at what age do kids start to realize that they are responsible and that they can take their health into account and that it matters? That's a tough one um, because – Kids, in general, developmentally don't think about what I do today affects the future. Yeah. And so that, it's really hard to instill that in them. I mean, some, some teenagers or young adults even don't quite get that. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so that, that's a tough one. But, you, I mean, you start, you try, and you encourage them and, and talk to them about it, even at, I would say, elementary school. And, and to switch gears, we were talking about this off camera a little bit, are the regional statistics with obesity. Um, and I've got a laundry list again here of stats, but South Carolina and North Carolina, the South, are particularly afflicted. Um, well, why? We like our fried Twinkies. <laughs> we, all right. We, we like, I mean, is, is it just that simple or is there something more going on? Is the South just culturally more prone to it or is it an education issue? I don't have an answer for that. You know, I just think it's such a complicated issue. I mean, it is, I was talking actually with my son on the way, you know, later, earlier this afternoon. I'm like, what's different in your mind, you know, from like 10 years ago, 15 years ago? And, you know, I mean, we could, we could talk about video games and we could talk about sedentary lifestyles and sitting inside and parents being afraid to let their children roam and play in the streets. I mean, there's less sidewalks. I mean, there's so, it is such a complicated issue. Um, and, you know, how we use food, is it, is it for comfort? Is it when we're bored? Is it because we have low self-esteem? I mean, we, you know, we could spend the next 
decade trying to hone in on what it is. And I think for me anyway, it's about uh, providing people with an, a belief and, and a, a belief that they are responsible on some level, even the little ones, mm -hmm. you know, to do mm -hmm. what they can. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And to kind of quit blaming everything else, you know. At some right. point, we've got to just say, you know what, i got to do something here. Mm -hmm. Which is not easy. I'm not suggesting that it's easy at all. And that's a good point. And talking trends, when we look at trends, um, have you seen over time more kids coming in who face these obesity problems? Is this something regional or is this something that's kind of been, been building? I think... I, would, I mean, I have not done any, I haven't sat down and looked at my patient population in particular, but I would say yes, and that's just a kind of a gut feeling yeah. that I do think it is more of a, more of a problem. Would you say the yeah. same? I was going to say, if you look at nationally at trends, you mm -hmm. know that every right. state starts to get more and more mm -hmm. obese as time yeah. has gone by in the last couple decades, and so that's probably also true of North Carolina and our own region as well. And there's something, and Jen, this is anecdotal, obviously, but a lot of public health people will say that the fit are getting fitter and the fat are getting fatter. And when we look at Charlotte locally, let's take Queens Road after work one day, right. there's a ton of people running. So there's clearly a component of society that really wants to be fit. There are these ultra marathons and all this sort of stuff. Do, do you find that, that the people who are fit want to hone in more and the people who aren't don't necessarily care? Well, I think it's clearly the fitter are getting, or the fit are getting fitter. Um, how many people do you know that are running marathons these days? I mean, it's yeah. just kind of become the benchmark of I have to do this to be the ultimate, you know, runner. Um, I see a lot of 26.2 stickers right. on the car. Yes. <laughs> right. It's a huge thing right now. Um, Charlotte's full of road races, huge running community. Um, but I think for those that aren't active and feel a little either resistant towards it, maybe they're not ready to make that change yet in their life, you can't force it. They have to come to that conclusion mm -hmm. on their own that today I'm changing my life. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to sign up for couch to 5K. The first day I might walk and huff and puff more than I'm going to trot. But, you know, with every day there's that progress. But it has to be self-driven and self-motivated. I think if you look at the general trend as well with the fit becoming fitter, you also have to think about who the the fat are that are becoming fatter and yeah. and know that a lot of our population is low income and can't mm -hmm. don't even mm -hmm. picture themselves running marathons mm -hmm. or running or doing triathlons because that's so foreign to them that maybe mm -hmm. exercise needs to become more convenient or you know accessible food needs to become more convenient for them so that they can at least start to get on that path and not expecting them to buy really expensive bikes and, and go on triathlon. And that's, and that's a valid point, the idea that for, for a big segment of society, we may take it for granted, but for a segment of society, exercise is not something you just do for fun because you want to run a marathon. Yeah. How do you convince a, a young woman, or a young man, but a young woman and girls on the run that, I shouldn't say convince, but how do you encourage them to understand that exercise is a fun thing and they can create goals even if they never saw themselves as maybe an athlete? Yeah, and I do think it's about access. You know, mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. of, um, I grew up in a home where this was going on, so this is a no-brainer, and it's easy, you know, for me to just do this. So at Girls on the Run, we, we really do establish and do it in a way that is just completely fun. And we are very gender-specific, too, so it is a little bit, it's very girl-focused. So it's all about the fellowship, the friendship, holding your, your sister's, your girlfriend's hands while you do that 5K together, you know, and, and it, that becomes almost more important than the actual running. <laughs> you know, but I think it is the draw. I mean, that's why people practice yoga. Is it for the internal uh, sanctuary or quiet they find? What is it that this exercise gives you besides improved cardiovascular functioning and a healthier body? Because it gives so much more, you know. But that's true for adults, too. Yeah, it's much more fun to work out when you're meeting your, your friends yeah. to do it than yeah. doing yeah. it on your own. Yeah. 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 We'll talk solutions when we come back, but first, I am going to be put through a fit minute. Personal trainer Jen over here is going to, uh, she's going to show me some exercises. It'll be stuff that you can take home that's actionable for you to do at home safely and effectively. This week on Fit for All, we're talking about building leg strength, and personal trainer Jen's with us in studio to show us some single leg squats. Now, I'm nervous about this one. It's a little bit more difficult, but Jen, run me through it. What are we doing? All right, single leg squats, guys. These are great for building stability in the hips, the knees, the ankles, helping you prevent injuries and move better in your day-to-day -day life. So, Bobby, you're going to be balancing on one leg. Hands can be on the hips or out in front of you. 
And all you're gonna do is just simply bend into this leg. But option one would be to start holding onto a chair just so you can get a feel for the motion. In your single leg squat, looking for this knee to stack over the ankle, it's gonna wanna cave in, but you're really focusing on stabilizing through the hip, through the ankle. How's that feel? I'm already burning. It, yeah, you really now, feel it in the hips. And, and I can feel it. We talk a lot about squats for people who are doing it at home. Do you want to be on your toes or on your heels? So for the squats, you usually want to feel the weight in your heels, being able to wiggle your toes around in the top of your shoe. Oh, got it. Yep, and lifting your chest up as you squat, gazing at the Ooh. camera. <laughs> All right, let's take the chair away and see how you do with no assistance. All right. Same thing now, we're doing the exact same motion exact as the chair. Exact same movement, no chair. Perfect. Just creating a little bit more of a challenge for your body. Lifting the chest, Ooh. awesome. Reaching through the heel. Great, Bobby. You guys can see me shaking at home. Well, this is, I feel this in the butt, I feel it in the quad. I mean, there's a lot of areas that this hits. Right. And is there any concern for people with knee injuries or ankle injuries in the past? This is actually a great exercise for people with knee and ankle injuries to help you build that strength to stabilize the joints. Um, and you're also not using any weight here. You're lifting your own body weight. So it's very safe exercise. Which is always good, and you can do it anywhere. Right? That was fit for all. I am fit for no one right now. I'm winded. <laughs> Welcome to Ask the Doc, our mailbag segment. I'm with Dr. Pam Young from the Matthews Children's Clinic. And our question this week is from Joan in Huntersville. And Joan writes us, I'm concerned I'm sitting too much at work. Is there a magic number of too many hours in front of a desk that I should stay away from? I wouldn't say that there's a magic number. Um, probably it's good to get up and move around every couple of hours. Um, there's no limit on how much time in front of a desk, but try to incorporate physical activity where you're actually moving around at least an hour, 30 minutes to an hour every day. And is there something where, where people at work can take calls on the run? They can, they can walk certainly, with people meetings? Certainly, lunch breaks are a great time. You can walk in the hall, you can walk around the building walk stairs, the, um, or yes, if you, can, if you can do your job while you're walking, that's a, gr that's a great option. Great. Thank you, Dr. Young. If you have a question for the Ask the Doc segment, go on cltblog.com. You can find us there. You can also tweet us at a healthier CLT or on Facebook, a healthier Charlotte. Now, back to the show. And we are back on A Healthier Charlotte. Thanks for sticking with us. We were talking about obesity locally, and we're going to talk about solutions in the second half of the forum. Um, we obviously don't have days and hours and, and weeks to discuss this because there are a lot of different solutions. But first off, the idea that we can't necessarily pin obesity on one cause. Um, if we could, there's a lot of things going on, but I guess I'd like to hear all your perspectives. What are some of the biggest causes of obesity? Poor diet. Um, overall, I think um, access to food is an issue and access to healthier, safe ways to do physical activity are issues, um, and making, making sure that people can actually cook when they do have access to the food is also a big concern. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about different, <laughs> different things, but um, it's, it's a multifactorial issue that has many, many, many causes and many, many, many reasons why it's become an epidemic. Well, you know, and there are many, many, but the one that I would sort of move in on is I, I remember I was with a group of little girls, and this girl was running her first lap ever in her entire life, or half mile, and she runs over to me, and she's freaking out because she says, something's wrong with my chest. It's like, it's like moving. It's, it's, <laughs> it's doing something. And, you know, this child had never felt her heart beat fast like that, as well as sweat. Like, her body was just freaking out, and she didn't know what to do. And I think sometimes we, I take that for granted. There's like a body awareness, mm -hmm. this understanding that, hey, mm -hmm. you know, food, all of this is connected. And mm -hmm. I really think sometimes people just lose that connection, that what I eat yeah. shows mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I, I agree with what they've both said. And um, unfortunately, it can't just be one thing. And exercise mm -hmm. by itself will not solve the problem. Right. So there has to be changes made in the diet. and. Um, making healthier food choices, teaching parents how to make those healthy foods available for their kids, and um, also not to use food as a reward. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, I mean, just to sum up everyone's comments, people are eating more, moving less. Um, the organization, which I have my personal training certification through, says that 75% of the adult population doesn't get the recommended amount of activity 30 minutes a day. 
which is just, you know, 75%. So there's just the issue of the increasing portion sizes and unhealthy foods, and couple that with people not moving, and I think it's a huge cause of the epidemic. And that's a big thing. If you're concerned with numbers, the CDC actually says that the average 10-year-old in the United States weighs 10 pounds heavier now than they did in the 1960s. The average adult is 25 pounds heavier. And the average meal for an adult male is 800 more calories than it was in the 1960s. And we're not even talking about quality of food, any sort of that stuff. So I guess moving forward with solutions, um, you know, I don't want to say that we're proponents of a soda tax with the No Fizz America thing, but that is one thing on the table. But government can't be the only solution here. It's one. Um, on, a, on a personal level, I guess, with medicine, when you deal with patients, is, it, is, is, indiv is individual responsibility kind of paramount? Do they just need to suck it up and get better? I mean, how do we, how do we encourage people on an individual level to be healthier? I mean, I think it's unfair to expect uh, a family to just deal with it. I can say a thousand times over to a family, you just need to eat healthier and go exercise. But if they don't have the money, they don't have, you know, if they have to take two buses and walk a mile to go get to a grocery store, that's just unfair for me to, to ask of them. And so I think that it's important that we address it. We need to be checking BMIs in, in our patients and categorizing children in, in, in ways that we can figure out who's at risk and who we worry about. As physicians, we need to learn more about nutrition and exercise ourselves so that we can actually share that mm -hmm. information with our mm -hmm. families. Um, there's maybe two hours of nutrition education in medical school that I remember um. having, and so that's just <laughs> not enough to, to be able to really speak to our families about good, healthy eating. So I think we need to make, make our families aware. We need to start there, but there's so much more that even as physicians, we can do to, to advocate for better health and access. And, and I want to come back to the preventative medicine point in a minute here. But another thing for physicians, how much the conversation when you deal with children is actually kind of geared to the adults saying, we need to start living healthier at home mm -hmm. with the responsible adults mm -hmm. and it'll trickle down to the kids. Probably a good portion, well over half, because, I mean, especially for the children that are in elementary school, their, their food choices are what the parents bring into the house. And, mm -hmm. you know, when they tell me, well, well, he only likes to eat chips. Well, don't buy them. <laughs> if they're not yeah. there, then you, you know. He's then, not driving yeah. himself to the store. Right, no, yeah. right. Yeah. Right, so I, well over, over half is, is directed to the parents. And, and we talk about the individual level from a medical perspective. We'll talk about it from a fitness perspective in just a second. But the, the relationship I'm interested in now between government and individual is kind of the public health, the partnership. And having not only nonprofit organizations, but they factor in how do nonprofits and independent organizations function in this spectrum of finding a sustainable solution to obesity? Yeah, I think, I think there's a number of nonprofits that are tackling this issue, and they all come in with their own little niche and their own belief and philosophy behind it. Um, certainly, I promise you, when I started Girls on the Run, first of all, the obes obesity issue wasn't even on the table. This was 16 years ago. Second of all, that is not really part of our conversation. However, it is an outcome. You know, if a yeah. kid moves around more, they're going to be healthier. And I think that may be, you know, our secret as to why it's working because we're we're more about focusing on the positive that kids bring, and not so much on their exterior. And and so I don't know how to explain it. It's like the benefits, yeah, are are endless, but that isn't where we're putting our hard emphasis. It's more on the like interior. It's a of that holistic girl. Yeah, approach. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and and it's sort of the same thing on the individual level. We've talked about with holistic approach mm -hmm. and being a whole person, but. It, at what point do people, do you find people are finally taking a hold of their own fitness? Is, is there a certain point that they say, okay, I'm sick of, you know, sick and tired of being sick and tired or whatever the phrase is, and people finally say, this, I'm drawing a line in the sand, I'm getting healthy from here. I definitely see that. And, you know, I think the important thing with that when you do reach that point is being okay with some setbacks. It's not going to be an easy golden ro road. It's going to take a lot of work. It's not going to be easy at first. It's not. It might not feel really great at first, but just knowing that you're doing the right thing for your body. But I do think people just reach that point where they have to internally decide this change is happening in my life. And can, oh, and can I piggyback on that? Go ahead. Just, just, uh, and I think that is a, an important metaphor, really, for just the human, like being human. You yeah. know, you mm -hmm. you just can't set off and do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if sometimes there doesn't need to be, honestly, some forgiveness in this, you know? Yeah. Okay, so you've led this lifestyle that hasn't necessarily been the most healthy, but that's okay. You know, you can start now, and it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be perfect. You know, you, there's going to be small steps 
and those will move you forward. And along the same lines, there have been studies that have looked at success of diets or, or changing lifestyle. And if you just make a little change, like right. you don't go all of a sudden, okay, this week I'm working out 30 to 60 minutes every day. It's let's do it for two days exactly. this week. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get there. But we're just doing it for two days. So, it, And something we're all kind of talking about, and you mentioned it earlier, the preventative issue. We could have an entire show and an we could write a book. We could go all the way on preventative versus reactive medicine and medical care in this country and everything. Mm -hmm. But do we need to start paying more of an attention in the healthcare industry to preventing these things before they occur and before we start medicating and surgery and whatever? Absolutely. I mean, it's so much harder to lose 30 pounds once you've put it on as opposed to just starting off eating healthier. And so I think a lot of our, our healthcare needs to start moving towards educating families and educating patients about what healthy lifestyles are. And starting from day one, you know, when a mom is pregnant with a baby and starting nutrition education there so that when her baby is born, she knows you know, proper nutrition for her child, you know, focusing on breastfeeding, focusing on um, proper nutrition for the mom, the kids, so that along the way, those are just things that you do. It, like we mentioned earlier, that's just part of life. It's not something that you have to start doing. It's not a chore. It's just part mm -hmm. of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Something actually that I'd like to touch on, um, the American Asso Academy of Pediatrics says that the generation growing up now will be the first one not to outlive their parents. And it's because of chronic disease. It's because of obesity. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we change it? I mean, is there a fix to that? Or, or does this just keep getting worse? And in 20 years, we'll be looking at 90% obesity rates. I, th I, Go ahead. I have hope. I mean, first of all, that this, first of all, we're talking about this, this, you know, second of all, there's an awful lot going on that I think there's a lot of interest in this now. So I think it's, we may be on the, still on the upswing, but I do think it's got to, it's, at some point, it's going to start to get better. Something's got to give. And we haven't yeah. even talked about food marketing and all that yeah. sort of, but there's yeah. a lot of components that need to give to make this happen. Mm -hmm. right. And I was going to say, too, that just the awareness in the healthcare industry, and I think some of the insurance companies are coming around mm -hmm. to paying for preventative care and not just for treatment. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's some insurance companies too. will help with gym costs, yoga mm -hmm. memberships, mm -hmm. all kinds of things, massage, mm -hmm. physical mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, again, well, I mean, yeah. is that an access issue for people who have the job yeah. or who have the... Right. Yeah. That's right. a separate right. issue. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess the, the, the final thing, and, and I'm going to ask every one of you for your own perspective, but where do we start? We're talking about doing one thing. I know you all have your own respective mm -hmm. niche. Where do we get started on tackling this? What's the first thing we can do? Well, I think it's important to know just here in Charlotte that we actually have a Healthy Weight, Healthy Child Coalition that came together that's, you know, medical professionals, the school system, media, community organizations that have all come together and, and tried to figure out, you know, where the problems are. They've asked patients, families, community members to try and come up with a, a plan. And um, they actually published a blueprint in 2010 saying these are the things that we need to focus on. Now we need to move from there and take each individual step and say, hey, who's going to work on that part of it? So that we're actually working together and not just being individual groups and organizations that are reinventing the wheel a thousand times over. Yeah. I think we all just need to start talking to each other and collaborate so that we have the public sector, the private sector, all working together to, to attack obesity. And that's a good point. There's plenty of different, Molly, you mentioned there's a lot of different organizations working on this, but if we're all going in different directions, yeah. so where do we start? Yeah. Well, you know, and I'm all about individual, like my responsibility, you know, what can I do within the eight feet of world around me, you know, and I just know that, you know, and I can get very emotional about this. I can just look at a kid and, and or an adult and say, you know, your greatest potential, what is inhibiting that? And if it is your weight, you know, if like that is not allowing you to be the best person that you can be, let's talk about that because the greater you needs to get out, you know, yeah. and, and really look at that from the holistic perspective and have that conversation with friends, the girls I serve, you know. Probably for me, I'm just, it's, it's one patient at a time mm -hmm. and hopefully a little, you know, make it, make a dent eventually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Work slowly and sustainably. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, for me, I would just say goal setting, you know, taking charge of your life, taking charge of your health making those small milestones to add up to one big culmination of feeling better, moving more, eating he more healthy. Took my final thought. Any final, any final thoughts from you? Anything else? So we identified the issue here, obesity, which you may have known intuitively at home was an issue, and we kind of quantified it today with the forum. Um, a couple th final thoughts that I'd like to leave you guys with to take away. 
Um, we can talk healthcare costs. We can talk statistics. I can give you numbers all day, and it may not necessarily matter because it's hard to wrap your head around the fact that as many as 200 million people in this country may be overweight. But the issue is, and the idea is, that it's got to come a multi-pronged attack from each angle from each area has to come to find a solution. Government does have to play a role. We do have to create policy, whether it's infrastructure, sidewalks so people can walk around and bike, whether it's something like a food tax or a fat tax, which may be controversial, but studies show that it works, or whether it's some sort of individual policy where people can get healthy, like the President's Council on Fitness. Government must play a role, but it's not the end of the story. Individually, we all have to play a role to encourage ourselves, our families, and each other to live healthy lifestyles and live positively. We don't all need to eat organically and be perfect, but we do need to take some steps in the right direction. And organizations like Girls on the Run International, a lot of different nonprofits, even for-profits, have to function in here and create a, a three-pronged attack, if you will, to challenge obesity and to get people living healthier, more positive lives. The takeaway for you guys at home from the show today, start moving. Pick something, do something. We kind of hit it again and again and again, but take one small change, whether it's going outside every day, eating vegetables, maybe eating breakfast every morning. Do something simple that you know is positive. Perfect it. It could take a week or a month or a year, but get a habit, get a sustainable habit going and build off that. We want to hear about you guys having a sustainable thing where instead of losing weight for a month and living very well for 30 days, it's something you can do easily for the rest of your life. That's it for A Healthier Charlotte this week. Remember, you can find us on cltblog.com. You can also find us on Twitter at A Healthier CLT. And on Facebook, look, A Healthier Charlotte. I am also on Twitter and Facebook, Bobby DeMuro. If you have any questions, please contact me. I can get them in front of the right uh, medical professional, the right health professional, and whomever. Thanks for tuning in this week. We'll see you next week with a group of healthy living bloggers. So if you're into social media, new media, and it's communication nexus with health, it'll be a show for you. Can't miss it. Thanks a lot for tuning in.